Thank you all so much for being here in person and virtually. We are delighted to see you. I'm going to start just by reading the introduction of Unrestricted, uh, and then we will start chatting and perhaps do a bit more reading down the line. You own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. Anne Lamott, Bird by Bird, some instructions on writing and life. Introduction. Sometimes life shares lessons quietly, employing whispers or bird song, side glances, or at distant memories stirred by the faintest hint of an ancient scent. Lessons in this subtle form come when we are prepared to listen, though we are not always prepared to listen. So life meets us where we are, delivering a more impactful message, more boom, less whisper. History shows that I prefer my lessons to arrive as internalized verbal lashings. At that decibel level, I begin to hear. I practice tuning my ear to the sweeter communiques to spare myself the harsher directives. It is a stumbling, imperfect journey. Anorexia nervosa isolates and kills like the true predator that it is, yet contrary to typical predatory behavior, it seeks the strongest, the brightest, the kindest, and the most capable. Anorexia craves the best. So first, it must weaken its prey with the most powerful weapon of all, thoughts. This predator usurps the logical processes of the mind, generating a Mobius loop of self-loathing. Starvation is merely a method, one that can further warp the mental faculties with this endless counting, denial, craving, restriction, allowances, guilt, confessions, and penitence. Anorexia nervosa, anor mm, anorexia nervosa orchestrates a complex death march of religious proportion. Ideas matter and they guide behavior. In a state of crisis, expediency may mask the influence of integrated ideas and the belief systems they create. Still, the core of your philosophical underpinnings informs your decisions, no matter how blinded your visibility is into the process. Ideas about identity and worth are a driving force behind behavior and by extension, personal history. Anorexia wrote several chapters of my story. My consort for many years, the most lethal of the scientifically classified mental illnesses. I know him intimately. This book is not scripture. One cannot simply pluck out a line or a passage and assume that it holds an exclusive truth. It doesn't. The book, I hold in my hands is a journey of changing perspectives of the in the moment existential truths of one person, me. By my 22nd birthday, I had cheated death twice. I then spent the next 14 years expecting the dark angel to drop in any time to collect on the debt. This book is not intended to provide tips and tricks on how to emaciate oneself. I am familiar with the mind of the anorectic and I know that she reads memoirs and attends group therapy sessions, an awful idea for the record, to acquire new and secret methods of successful starvation. While I shed light on the waypoints of my psychological expedition during the throes of my illness and then through my healing odyssey, I will not provide a roadmap into the abyss. My hope is that my own story will meet you where you are on your journey and provide you a satisfying meal, not a self-absorbed and incomprehensible bite. The use of feminine pronouns in reference to the anorectic throughout this book is deliberate. The overwhelming majority of those who suffer from anorexia are women. Of necessity, women worldwide for millennia have become experts at translating information packaged for men for their own practical use. An additional daily burden with too often a significant gap in translational meaning, particularly as relates to one's own health care. This book wishes to reduce the burden on women to require no gender translation effort from the young women suffering from this life-threatening disorder to allow for as minimal a gap as possible in relatability. To the extent that other gendered persons suffering from anorexia are able to use the content of this book in translation to gain benefit and insight, it is welcome and embraced. This book seeks to unmask the construction and content of the belief system and the prime mover of the anorectic mind, the predatory monster, the hunter, the voice. 
In the pages that follow, I hope to remind you in a more gentle form than that of my own experience, that we have all been placed upon this small spinning rock to be meaningfully present to one another. Never underestimate your ability to fundamentally alter another person's world. Like you, I read for, for, for far too many reasons to list here, but perhaps the primary one, aside from the feline curled up cozy and consumed quality of a good read, is that I find my humanity again and again in someone else's story. The completely separate existence of another feels profoundly familiar and deeply informative about my own world and my most personal places. I count on this experience and lean into it like an old friend. We fear most what we do not understand. Sharing our stories opens the door to connecting with the other. Woven within each chapter are elements of the culinary and psychological worlds. The point of contact between these two lands is a familiar place for anyone who has tread into the darkly haunted forest of an eating disorder. At the edge of this forest, I speak from a space large enough to hold a comfortable nest, layering branches and strings to create a dense platform on which I can stand, gain perspective, and call for more understanding adding my bird song to the cacophony of questions, spoken and silent, and the hope for life-saving answers. Your existence alone, coupled with love, the fewer conditions, the better. Patience, more than you think you have, and spacious awareness, soft focus, minimal distractions, holds the potential for the creation of miracles. Go all in on the beauty side of life. Just be prepared for the blissful fallout. The capacity of the human heart to love is boundless. Seize every opportunity to love boundlessly. You're worthy of so much applause, my dear. <laughs> this book is so much more than a memoir. And I wanna talk about the theory that you posit at the heart of it. Um, you know, for those who haven't read it, this is a book that is one, one woman's journey, not just through anorexia, but familial relations, romantic relations, and so much more. Um, but let's address anorexia, because for so long, it's been seen as, as a very female-centric mental health crisis. And it's been posited that anorexia exists because women, women are controlling we want to control ourselves, we want to control others, we want to manipulate, we're superficial. So many just highly insulting um, theories. But you posit in this book that anorexia is about shrinking oneself to fit a space. And I'd love to hear you talk about that more. Thank you, Carrie. First, I have to thank Carrie Garvin for being here tonight. <laughs> One of the most extraordinary women I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Thank you, Carrie. Without Carrie, Carrie's midwifery, um, this book would never have come to be. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Anorexia is not about control. I hope it's carved onto my gravestone. And I appreciate that you um, just dove right in with the word insulting. What I what I find in this conversation, as we've taken this conversation um, across the country and in, in many other places, is that it feels to me like the discussion around what anorexia is or isn't is part of this process of modernizing our view on things, especially as relates to women. And I think that anorexia is up for that modernization because when you, or I'll say, I'll speak for myself, when I look at the story around anorexia and the anorectic, which is exactly as you described, one of um, needing to control one's environment at the moment that it is out of control, Never mind that the anorectic girl is probably the woman whose environment is least likely to be out of control. Um, it's, it is insulting. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know what it was, but I knew that it wasn't that. Mm -hmm. Having been told that um, when I was going, you know, when I was going in for um, medical appointments along the way, it didn't feel right, it didn't resonate, and it frustrated me. As I started to write the book, I came 
to this understanding for myself. And it seems to resonate um, beyond anorexia, which is lovely that anorexia is not about trying to control anything, um, not even yourself. It's a shrinking to the space that you're allowed to take up in your life. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear your journey uh, as, as a survivor of anorexia and, and how you came to this realization that this, this isn't about me trying to be controlling or domineering. This is about kind of pressure from the outside world, from outside forces, from other people imposing themselves on you. And, you know, I, so much of, of mental health crises and medical diseases have only, you know, been, been researched or practiced upon men. And this is a mental health crisis that affects women 10 times as much as it affects men. And I'm curious also to hear, you know, why, what, what you think is at play there, why it affects women so much more than men. Such a great question. I think it's surprising uh, to a lot of people to learn that ratio that it affects 10 times as many women as men. And um, this, the statistic that anorexia is the deadliest mental health disorder. Uh, I think that, I think people find that to be fairly surprising. And I, and I think that's because, you know, you don't, we don't talk about it very much. Mm -hmm. And you would expect the deadliest mental health disorder to be talked about quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, but it isn't. And it really never has been. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have all the answers. And the first thing I want to say is I'm not a medical professional. I'm speaking entirely from my personal experience, but I think it's more than just genetics, uh, which certainly plays a role and neurobiology, which also plays a role um, as to why women are so much more frequently affected mm -hmm. by this devastating disorder. I, I do believe it has a lot to do with the social pressures and not from a superficial perspective. Mm -hmm. And in a moment, if it's okay, I'll read a bit into chapter one, which might give a bit more context around kind of the theory and then we can really flesh it out from mm -hmm. there. Um, but yes, I think there's a lot more, there's a lot more at play here than um, comparison or even uh, social media or those things that certainly aren't helping, um, but they're not the compelling driver uh, for essentially starving yourself to death. That has to be something bigger. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's so many devastating reports coming out that, you know, our, our girls and our young women are facing devastating suicide rates, devastating levels of depression and anxiety. And, you know, in reading so much material on this, it seems that, you know, a lot of people want to point to social media and say, no, it's about girls being superficial. It's about comparing themselves to others and, you know, that making them, them feel bad about themselves. And I feel like that's, addressing a symptom of our patriarchal society rather than um, that that would be a more successful inlet to addressing and treating these mental health crises. I'm curious how you feel about you know, these devastating statistics that are coming out about young know, girls and, and women and this increased suicide rates. Anorexia has existed since social media was like tribal gossip. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and probably at the same rates. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with that. I think there are escalators on a lot of mental uh, illness challenges mm -hmm. in the world right now. And social mm -hmm. media is certainly one of them. But pointing to it as a cause is missing the entire point. I know you and I have been um, in conversation for weeks now about a re report that was released by the CDC recently. Uh, they they file this report on a cadence with um, high school students and um, and the data that's come out of the most recent report, uh, which is available on any of your major news outlets, um, is terrifying. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. uh, so it includes data so like this. Um, and uh, the, the, data, the data was pulled in the fall of 2021 and it um, queried high school students and for this particular data set, high school girls um, in private and public high schools across the US. And again, they're, they're comparing two cohorts on, on a regular cadence. Um, separate from that report, let me just start with this, the incidence of eating disorders increased 60% during the pandemic. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with that right now. Um, but within this report, we learned that 24% um, of girls have created a suicide plan, 24%. Not just ideation, a plan. 13.5% of them um, uh, have been sexually assaulted. 
there might be some relationship there. Um, and six out of 10 reported some time in the last you know, set duration of time that they lost interest in activities that they loved, uh, which is obviously like a cardinal sign of depression and, and a number of other um, cascading mental illnesses. So something is very wrong in the world. And, and I would argue it is escalating um, against women and young women. Mm -hmm. And if I can share a, a piece of data from a researcher that I deeply admire um, from your alma mater, uh, Dr. Amy Cuddy, she's a Harvard social psychologist. You probably know her best as the um, power posing TED talk. Uh, she's absolutely brilliant and does incredible work in the space of um, gender and space. And with these, we discovered as, as we talked um, earlier this month, these really natural overlaps into eating disorders while she's not studying them directly. Um, these are, there are so many ways in which uh, what's happening socially is, is affecting um, the, the rates of eating disorders. So in this study, she wanted to understand uh, gender stereotypes, which are set at around the age of five. Most of our stereotypes are set, um, science has discovered around the age of five. So she and her colleagues um, studied four-year-olds and six-year-olds with art posing dolls. So these are genderless wooden dolls that you can you know, form into specific shapes. 16, and kind of wide open space taking shapes, 16 and shrinking confining shapes. At the age of four, the majority of the children identified these genderless wooden dolls um, according to the shape. So boys take up space, girls shrink. By the age of six, it was 100%. Wow. That should scare the crap out of all of us. Yeah. Six year olds identifying this as a woman, this as a man genderless uh, are opposing dolls. So my, my thought is from that research and others that we integrate these ideas that we should be small very early on, that we should shrink in physical and every other way to make space for those who are frankly taking up too much space. That's my argument in the book. Get out of the space. Yeah, <laughs> that's mine. Yeah, that um, and I argue that right at the point of taking up more space in one's life, intellectually, socially, physically, um, right at the point of kind of becoming pretty inconvenient, we were all pretty inconvenient in adolescence, I, I think, um, that is the onset point for most um, anorectics. And of course, that onset is, is shifting earlier and earlier, uh, which is also a problem, but right when you are to begin to individuate and fulfill mm -hmm. whomever you are to become, that is the point at which through, for whatever reason, and I certainly have ideas about that, you choose instead to shrink. I would love to hear those reasons and, and what you felt that was your onset on your own journey that, that I, and I know, spoiler alert, like we should all read the book and discover <laughs> it, but you know, in, in this discussion, I, I'd love to hear about your own journey. Yeah. I'll give a little bit of context and then I'll, I'll read because it'll give a bit more color. Mm -hmm. um, I think that every young woman has, has her own reasons. And honestly, society is enough. It doesn't have to be some overbearing figure in your life. So if you have that, I would argue you're probably going to have a harder, harder time. Um, for me, it was a, a very strict religion uh, from a very young age um, that didn't seem to care too much about what men were doing, but cared a lot about what women were doing. Um, I had a, a father who's diagnosed as a narcissistic sociopath. It's not something I call him, that is a clinical diagnosis. And um, that is very space taking, one can imagine. And uh, it essentially taught me that I was worth nothing except in as much as I reflected well onto someone else. And of course, in, in my case, onto a man. Um, and I think those two, two things and, and with a whole lot of social pressures and expectations thrown in um, were, were enough to flip yeah. that switch, whatever that, whatever that genetic trigger, you know, trigger is. Do you have any questions from the audience? Because I know I could talk to Don forever. <laughs> but yes. I have a question for you. Yes. So as as you know, I'm glad that you said what you were saying about taking up space, because as men or as young men, we are taught, you know, from from ground up that you know you always have to be bold, you always have to be big and take up space. So and, and there's always this shift in our mind 
that, you know, when we feel like, okay, I'm a man, and you know, even how I'm sitting right now, I'm sitting legs wide open, I'm taking up space. When was that shifting your mind of when enough is enough? You know, because it's about I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm -hmm. When was that shift? When did that shift happen in your mind? And what was your first thought, if, if you can speak on that? That is a beautiful question. So the question is, um, from a man in the audience sitting like a man. Um, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> man spreading. <laughs> Noting that, that was, that's training for young men. And I think this, that's a great part of the conversation. Uh, you know, that, that, that is how men survive in this world. We all have our way, right? And, and the question was at what point, and correct me if I'm wrong, but at what point did I and my space shrinking? decide that enough was enough, that I was sick of being held to this smaller space where, I, you know, when I felt like obviously I should take up more. In so many ways, again, this is not just physical. I love that question. Mm -hmm. um, I think this kind of ties back into the religion and, and, um, it, and that, that's not the moment that I had the uh, recognition, but I think the reason it was so difficult to have that recognition is that, um, and I'm not trying to dog on any specific religion, but I was, um, I was raised in a religion that, um, held my behavior so captive. Um, I wore only skirts until I was 17. You must sit a certain way. There would be no like comfortable, like mm -hmm. spreading with the brain <laughs> um, uh, and, and in so many ways, like how, what I was allowed to wear and do um, and say um, kept me very contained. So I think I was that template was poured, you know, in cast in bronze. And, and so it was, it took me quite a while to have the thought that enough was enough because I was so well-trained. Mm -hmm. um, my enough was enough, and, and I think there were several of them. Um, and this isn't necessarily exactly when I got well from anorexia, but just the, this is, you know, it is wrong the way that I'm be, being held in the world, was in relation to my father, really, was, was just feeling like I mattered only in as much as I made him look good. I remember there was an evening, um, and again, not trying to dog on dad or religion, but just getting real honest here. Um, there was an evening where I had been laid off and I had had the pleasure of laying off my team after being laid off. And, uh, and I was quite exhausted and I promised my dad I would go visit him. Um, and he was staying two hours away or so. So after all of that, I drove up, um, to visit him and I, and I didn't bother telling him any of the story. I, I knew it kind of wouldn't matter. But I was pretty exhausted and it was pretty late at that point. And he started telling a story that I'd heard many times before that was kind of the, the like, why I'm very important to the world story, you know? And, uh, and I literally fell asleep oh, sitting out, which I kind of love. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was furious. Like, do not fall asleep while I'm speaking. And I was just like, well, then use my time with some modicum of respect, you know? Mm -hmm. And I really, I think that was one of several moments where I just realized I am, I am nothing in this world. And then I could translate that into other places in my world where I could tell that I was expected to both be exceptional and take no credit for it, own it, not at all, shine that somewhere else, shrink and continue to be exceptional as you're just mm -hmm. being pushed into it. That's actually a great, great segue into your next reading, Miss Dawn. I didn't know I would ever tell that story to bookstore. I knew it <laughs> it's, It is such a poignant moment, though, to, be, to, to have him build this space with, with the story of himself and have no recognition that my daughter is sleeping over here and just continue to talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was a beautiful moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then to be angry. That's great. So I loved it. Um, one of the really fun processes of this book was to select a quote, a beloved quote, to lead out each chapter. And of course, the intro was led by um, Anne Lamont, and each chapter is led by a quote. I, I collect, I collect quotes from far better writers than I. And this is a great example of that. The breaking of so great a thing should make a greater crack. William Shakespeare, Antony, and Cleopatra. Chapter one. Salt and Control. On the corner of Sun Valley Road and Main Street sits a bustling bistro. Columns of river rock support exposed brick walls. 
a bar runs the length of the room, heralding a commitment to regional beer and wine. Bartenders at the ready with a sample or a recommend and a backstory. The best seats in the house are benches built into a wall of windows offering a somewhat occluded view of Mount Baldy, the grand dame of the row of peaks that comprise the Sun Valley Ski Resort. Its size and presence providing perennial comfort to the valley below in the way that only tall mountains can. Covered with a thin cushion, the benches form a U of right angles. Bohemian flavored throw pillows allow one to burrow in for a protracted and cozy dinner, each additional course securing the prized real estate for another fraction of an hour. Here, I have shared meals with my family, my spouse, my dearest friends. New and lasting friendships have emerged out of conversations with neighboring tables in this three-sided, window-fronted getaway. It is a protected space. Ah, it is a protected and secluded space. One where more often than not, I dine alone. A practice that provides an opportunity to savor and settle, moseying my way through the uniquely sensual experience of a well-orchestrated and executed meal. In these moments, I am nowhere but here, absorbed by the desire to take it all in, to breathe and smell, taste and touch, see and feel the plated art that the chef has deliberately created. I am wide open, all in. It is a lovely exchange of appreciation, which is to say, presence. Sometimes a flash of inspiration prompts me to write a few words in the notebook that I always carry in my handbag. Other times, my bench neighbors will be social and I will oblige. Most often, I hold these moments for myself, for the sole purpose of filling my tired, scattered, deadline-driven mind with such an overload of delightful sensory input that all else fades. It is a reliably edifying and balancing ritual. On one such evening as spring succumbed to summer when the once vividly white snow at the very top of the governing peak mixed with dirt from May rains, I returned to this dining ritual to peel myself up from feeling stampeded, to become again three-dimensional, to nourish my fading sense of self. With an abundance of irons in the proverbial fire, I needed to withdraw from a few overextending decisions, to recover some guarded space in which to move about freely and to protect a few pockets of time not bookended by urgency and others' needs. I had become absorbed by the everyday. I had become indistinguishable from my usefulness. A single goblet of an Italian farmhouse red blend lasted all four courses house-made burrata with a wedge of homemade bread, wild yeast leavening Italian wheat, all smothered in the grassiest of olive oils. Mama's salad with globe grapes, kiki arugula, and salty earth pecorino, roasted brussels with grilled marcona almonds, sweetened lightly with saba, and the coup de gras affogato, a homemade vanilla bean gelato drenched tableside with hot, strong, freshly brewed espresso. A timeless marriage of complementary opposites, at the moment of the first kiss, espresso to gelato, a thermodynamic timer begins. All will soon melt and blend into a lukewarm coffee cream soup. The divine experience of this dessert lies in the instant of friendliness just beyond the stark distinction, the first melding, the curiosity of one substance for another. The dessert derives its name from the Italian word for drown. My senses still delighted, my mind unburdened. I stepped outside into the cool early summer evening, strolling the three blocks back to my hotel. The vanilla bean and espresso flavors lingered on the sides of my tongue. Gentle conversations with the neighboring table echoed in my eardrums. Without warning, swooped up from life and dropped unceremoniously onto the battlefield of the mind, I found myself trapped in a psychological flash flood pressed against invisible walls rising swiftly and jaggedly from the sidewalk like vertical cliffs impossible to climb, a random attack. Memories of simple pleasures experienced only a moment ago were ripped away. The emotional rapids rushed me. There would be no escape. Sobs lashed out of me, uncontrollably submerged by this drowning wave, choking their source with gasps of desperation until a wail crept out of my laterally stretched face a melodrama of sorrow escaping narrowly as a wounded wild animal from the steel jaws of a hateful trap. The sheer force 
pummeled shudders through my contracted form. And I spun into a free fall toward the depths of misery of self-hatred and self-destruction. I lumbered down the stairs from the sidewalk to my room, leaning all of myself into the door, its weight suddenly incomprehensible. Inside, I collapsed into a sinewy heap on the hotel bed. The monster was back. My annihilation, his goal. So alarming were the sounds coming from my shrinking self that soon a knock came at the door. The hotel manager arrived. He was a thoughtful young man who routinely double-checked my reservation to make certain that my room was conveniently located for my fur ball of a dog, Coco. Traveling this time without my beloved puppy, I still booked the ground floor, sharing a thin old wall of the ski bum hotel with the room reserved for the overnight staff. He had no doubt heard every terrible sound. I cracked open the weighted door present enough to feel a tinge of embarrassment but without the faculty to shift my current heavy reality. Someone died, I croaked. I am so sorry, he said with warm, sad eyes and a sincerely concerned tone that sounded almost relieved. He had no idea what to do next. There was nothing to do. I closed the door and slid without pause down its back until my bones hit the floor. In a way, my lie was terrifyingly accurate. Someone was dying me again and i thought i wanted to this time god damn it in these consuming <coughs> moments preferring solitude to rejection i shove away everyone and everything that i love or at least i try to some have seen this act of sudden rejection before and have given it the credibility it deserves which is to say none the monstrous cruel coup of my mind is recognizable in the behaviors that it compels it can be a thankless heavy task to love an anorectic. A mighty storm simmers just beneath the glimmering surface. We swim in dangerous waters. The threat of drowning is nearly always imminent. Rescuers, beware, sabotage lives here. I know that this subject matter holds not only the possibility, but the likelihood of moments that emit a sort of pungent acidity. <coughs> the imagery is gruesome, at worst, disconcerting, at least. After all, it is a story of starvation, nearly to death. I would love for this to be an old story that no longer affects me today, but it is not. I still dance with this devil. The moves are intricate and over time somewhat predictable. It is this predictability that I hope to illuminate and decode. The present reality of a desperate time is rarely well understood until a person has lived it, passed through it, and is on the other side. Looking back, beyond the imminent threat of returning to that place simply by connecting with it through physical and mental memory. The story I share here is now at a safe enough distance for me to turn back to face it, yet still close enough for my perspective to be accurate to the experience. It is recent history. Though memory is a tricky thing, it is fraught with danger and the soft sadness of old hurt soothed by behaviors that encourage amnesia. The cause of the hurt may be long forgotten, still the pain remains. The wonderings of hazy and faded recollections and the absolute uncertainty of truth contrast ironically with the burdensome weight of that sharp ache. What terrible thought does memory keep at bay? What door does it guard? What movement does the heft of it prevent? What connections have been lost to it? Countless, I know this for certain. Creating and maintaining space is the answer. Space and a clear distinction between what is me and what is not, between what I crave and what I must do to name and satisfy the need that has learned to mask itself with propriety and deprivation. Let's get this out of the way. Anorexia is not about control. Anorexia is about shrinking to accommodate the space that you have been allowed to take up in your life, the exact amount of space that you can hold without making anyone else uncomfortable. Healing from anorexia is an act of insubordination, of self-defense. Sorry to have interrupted your gorgeous prose. <laughs> with my coffee fit. Um, but thank you for reading that, Ms. Dawn. And 
Okay, something I've noticed throughout this book, of course, since I've read it many times, is how much I salivate throughout this book. <laughs> and uh, of course, Don was a professionally trained chef, but I, as you were reading this, to go from that almost like food euphoria of like the affogato and the gelato and the burrata, which is one of my personal favorites, to that devastating feeling of, of basically experiencing a death all over again. I'm curious, you know, what, you know, conscious decision you made to in infuse this book with your love of food, given the contrast to, you know, anorexia and, and the deprivation of food to, to shrink yourself and, and what your, your mindset was when you injected that into this book. I love that question. <laughs> I feel like any book I ever write is always going to be infused with food, but this one in particular, um, because I, for multiple reasons. One, I was obsessed with food when I was restricting myself from it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fairly common. I read cookbooks like they were novels. You know, they were just so intriguing, things that I, I would make and never eat. Um, but when I set out to write this book, First, I didn't set out to write a book. That's a whole other story we can get into. But when it started to become a book, um, my charge for myself was really two. I had two, I suppose. One, first, do no harm. And you heard that in the introduction. I will not create, um, I will not lamplight the path into the dust. You don't find numbers in here in terms of weight or calories or anything like that. I know that that is um, goal setting for others. And I, and I have no interest in doing any of that. Um, so I, I, purge the book of anything that might look that way. And if ever you find something, please tell me right away because my intention is to never support that journey. Um, but I also, the second charge, wanted to be completely honest. Um, there's a certain amount of vulnerability in this book, obviously. And uh, as we were receiving kind words from people that you put on the cover or inside, um, deeply personal kept showing up. Um, and, and I think that was a, just a, a call out to the, the honesty of, of what I share. And the, the truth is, food is a huge part of my life. It is, a, it is one of my great loves. And it was, ironically, even while I was ill. Um, so I was, um, I, like I said, I was, I was obsessed with food all along the way. So it only made sense to tell the story in the context of, of the food as well. I, for one, want to read that novel. That's a food-based novel. If not, please read a cookbook and let me publish it, please. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Do we have any, any questions from the audience or else I'm happy to monopolize this conversation with Dawn. Any, any questions so far, guys? Okay. So I would love to hear about your journey, how this, how this started and how it became a book, how you went from maybe I'm just going to, you know, write and try to uncover something for myself to no, I need to put this out into the world. You were a big part of that journey. <laughs> you were. So by my early twenties, I felt like anorexia was behind me. Those awful years they're back there. There's something I don't have to deal with anymore. And I get to live my life. I looked a little different than I had intended because of those years, but I was okay with that. And I was moving forward. Um, and then I discovered that wasn't exactly true. So I, uh, in my late twenties, had an experience and a couple others kind of along the way that um, I had two bouts with anorexia, two sort of you know severe acute bouts, and and I, I I have never had a third, and I don't intend to, but I had familiar thoughts and um, familiar patterns starting to creep up around certain situations that made me nervous enough that I knew, oh wow, okay, so this is not, um, I am not bulletproof. Um, and so I, I write to understand. I feel like I don't really understand something until I do sit down to write about it, like bookshelves of journals. And I sat down to understand how I got myself to that place multiple times to make sure I would never go there again. So that's really the core of the writing. And I think that's what makes it so deeply personal is that I never edited that out. You know, I felt like I was very much writing it for myself and had no idea <laughs> anyone else was ever going to read it. I only changed the tone at a certain point so that, you know, it, it was more for a reader than for me personally, but the, but the details of the figuring out how I did that to myself, that's all still in there. Uh, and I, I do think that's, that's how it became so personal. So my journey was 
in writing the book, discovering why I think um, I, I was able to nearly starve myself to death, um, what compelled that behavior. And, it, and, I, and because if I can understand it, right, then I can, then I can change it. Um, and, and then at a certain point, I, of course, thought, well, I don't know if my story relates to anyone, but wouldn't it be great if it did? I was sent to a, a wonderful wife to a writing workshop in Maine, and uh, that whole crew thought I had a book. Uh, they thought it needed some work, but they thought I had a book. And, uh, and, and so just that encouragement along the way and recognizing that maybe my story, even though I'm not claiming it as being prescriptive in any way, uh, maybe my story could help someone else. Well, I know you're not a, a doctor or a clinician or, or even a scholar of neurobiology or, or mental health crises, but your book has been blurbed by Dr. Thomas Insel, who's the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health. It's a pretty big deal, Don. So, you know, taking, taking that into mind, I'm curious how your treatment went when you were being treated for anorexia and how you wish it had gone. You know, if you, if you could go back and tell these clinicians, you know, this is how you treat, this is how you approach anorexia, um, what would that look like? It went badly initially, <laughs> um, but I, I also, I mean, I, I, I would love to use this opportunity to thank everyone on the stumbling imperfect journey that I call out in my uh, introduction who are trying. You know, unfortunately, the rates have not decreased. Our mortality rates have not decreased. Incident rates have not decreased. We still hold that perch of the deadliest disorder. It's not one, you know, it's not where you want to live. Um, there is no pharmaceutical treatment um, that's been, that has, you know, separated from placebo enough to be interesting. Uh, and only one therapy has um, proven to alter outcomes, and that's family-based therapy. And I've thoughts about why that is as well. But um, we just don't really know what we're doing in this space. And that is not to insult anyone. That's just to recognize the, 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 the raw truth. Um, so I appreciate those who did their absolute darndest, but I, I found the control claim just made it impossible for me to hear anything else. Um, I just, I, because I, did, I knew that wasn't true. I knew it was literally the opposite. I felt so controlled. So to feel so controlled and then to be told that I was being, it, just, it was too much uh, cognitive dissonance for me. And um, when I was um, participating in, in therapy, I, uh, I was party to group therapy and I called that out of my intro as well. <laughs> just a terrible idea. Um, well, all we did was teach each other how to get sicker faster, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so my, my experience wasn't positive. However, I, I, I have, um, I have total respect for those who are doing what they know to do. And, and I really just call out the industry from a, from a respectful perspective, um, as do Dr. Insel and Dr. Doriswamy and many others, um, that, you know, we, we can, and we have to do better in terms of what, what I think we could do differently. Obviously, I'll just say two things. And, and the obvious part for me is that I was a philosophy undergraduate. Uh, so lots of logic, you know, lots of, um, uh, lots of work in, in, in logic. And we spent a lot of time studying the importance of an axiom because that axiom, that core belief, that like a priori item that you all agree to, that determines where you can go from there. And I think that our axiom with anorexia is wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I really expected to receive a lot more pushback on that. I'm sure it's coming, um, but when it comes, I'm just gonna kind of say, well, show me the proof, like how, where have we gotten with that, right? So not that, not that it's something to throw a fit about, it's more just a recognition that doesn't seem to be working. So if your axiom isn't getting you where you need to go, it's probably time to go back to revisit the axiom. So uh, yeah, obviously the, the logic does not follow that anorexia is about control, or anything superficial. And I imagine being told that, having that you know, thrown at you, it, it, that this is the root cause of your mental health crisis just compounds it and makes it so much worse. And, and for girls and young women who are going through anorexia treatment right now, I'm, I'm curious what you would say to them, having been through this yourself. 
yeah, it, it does compound it. And, and that's, I think, the risk is that the very person who is charged with um, bringing you back from that brink, you simply have a break of trust. And, and your parents, you know, my, my mother was phenomenal. Like her heart 100% in the right place. If she sought out any information, she was reading that it's about control and these are these are the behaviors and they're manipulative. And um, one of the docs in my, in, um, in my intro here says, we thought the proper treatment was to fight fire with fire by trying to stamp out the obstinance of these suffering young ladies. We could not have been more wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's again, it's not just coming from my head and my experience. This is how clinicians have been trained. So what I would say to clinicians, what I would say to uh, a person dealing with anorexia, what I would say to clinicians is first, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Medicine's not a perfect science. It's not, we're all learning. Thank you for stumbling through. I, I, I would find it very frustrating um, not making the kind of progress I would want to make if I were committed to that path. So first, thank you. I think a little humility in the face of the data would be very helpful. Um, not that there's arrogance, but, but we just, we have to change it and you're only going to change it if you can kind of have the humility to step back and say, okay, maybe we need to look at this differently. Mm -hmm. um, so I would ask clinicians to both exercise some humility, knowing that whatever we're throwing at this right now is not working and to listen to really listen, that article that we were um, looking at earlier today and weeks ago when it first came out, the, the final, is in the Washington Post, the final line says, um, is a girl saying, I just, I wish that adults would take girls seriously. And I just wish they would listen. I, I think that would go a long way. For the young women, oh, I have a lot to say, but I'll keep it brief. Cause I think, I think it's really just this, um, you are enough you're enough. You came that way. You're always going to be that way. You can't break that no matter what you do. You are enough. And you are worth every ounce of the effort that it will take to get you from where you are now to a life that's worth living. And it is, it's, you are worth the effort and it is worth the effort. And that's what I would say. Are there, are there treatment centers or are there, are there doctors who who are, you know, following this path of, no, we've, we've got this all wrong. And to the, to a great devastating detriment of girls and young women in this world, are there doctors or treatment centers that you're in touch with who, who are reapproaching this? I think there are some folks doing things brilliantly. Mm -hmm. So family-based therapy has been shown to be beneficial. That's really tricky depending on what kind of family you come from, if they're going to participate in your family-based therapy. <laughs> yeah. Real limit there. That would not have worked in my family. I'll say just because we, yeah, wouldn't. I wouldn't have had the family there, right? So um, my mother absolutely would have been there, but um, the problem wouldn't have been there. Right? So, but family-based therapy uh, has been shown to have positive outcomes. And from my humble perspective, because I don't know, uh, but I think it has a lot to do with the final step of that process, which is the entire family fully supporting the individuation of the person, very specifically supporting her independence I think that's what's missing um, for a lot of young women going through anorexia. So family-based therapy um, is beneficial. I think it's it's tricky because when it, and, well, let me say a couple other folks who are doing great things and I'm gonna talk about the challenge of treatment because it's a real challenge. It's not, it is not easy to treat. There's a reason that we haven't gotten anywhere yet. It's not just because, you know, people think we're controlling an obstinate though. That's really not helping. Um, Dr. Walter Kay out of San Diego and, and his entire um, group there, they're doing beautiful work. That was the first lecture I heard that didn't feel insulting. It was when Dr. Walter Kay um, was speaking. Uh, there's a company called Compass Pathways that has um, just launched their phase two clinical trials in anorexia um, behind their very successful trials of treatment resistant depression with psilocybin. They're paving that path, um, thinking, you know, hey, these, these, this powerful weapon thoughts, they create ruts. And what if we could really just, you know, unlodge that and, um, be tuned into the, um, the subjective experience of the patient, right? Rather than kind of the objective experience of the objective experience of the clinician saying, you know, this is how you're doing it. Like how, what, what about the patient telling us how they're doing? So there's some really great work being done. Mm -hmm. I was going to say something else, but now I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have a question. So I know I'm going to ask you, uh, quite a few questions. No, not at all. When you think about like let's say for instance all the all of the industries that we have out here 
and especially speaking to the fashion industry, right? It's a multi-billion dollar industry where you, if you want to focus in on the young ladies that are models and how they're groomed, you kind of already spoke to it about what you would say to, you know, these, these young women uh, who are experiencing this, because it's, I honestly believe, I think we all believe that a lot of these young ladies are suffering in silence mm -hmm. and, um, and they don't necessarily, you know, I mean, maybe you can see it, but you know, you, you know what's going on, but nobody says anything. And I was going to ask, you know, what message would you give to those young ladies? But, you know, Gary already asked, you know, kind of that question, you already spoke to it, but I just thought it was a, a pretty interesting, like, thought of, how big that industry is, and they're getting better, obviously. Um, but still, you said young ladies that are still experiencing that. I just you know, give message to them. Yeah, the question is, what message would you give to um, young women who are experiencing this, and particularly even those in industries that are kind of known for it, right? You have you have fashion, you have dance, you know, gymnastics, you have other other um, long distance running, right? You have these these um, places where. Um, you have, you have honors programs, right? You have, you have like exceptional accomplishment um, areas. You have these, these spaces where maybe there's some higher concentration of this behavior. Um, yeah, society rewards it in so many ways. That, that's part of the challenge. Um, but I think for me, the, the deeper issue is that, um, you know, I wasn't interested because I was an honor student or I did any modeling or I was a long distance runner or any of these kinds of things. They just, you know, I, I fit nicely into those categories because I was ill. It just, it was um, it kind of a reverse of the chicken egg. So I wouldn't necessarily blame any of those industries for causing it. And I know I'm going a little bit of field from your question. And I'll get to that. But I, I think that, um, you know, that, that validation, or that reinforcement probably doesn't help. But it's not the, the reason that it's that the illness is happening in the first place. And I think, you know, what to say to those young women is that your value has, has nothing to do with this, nothing. Um, that flies in the face of everything we are told and see every day. Um, but I think when, when a young woman finds her worth in her process of becoming independent from those who are relying on her to kind of shine her light onto them, it gets a lot easier then to believe that your value isn't based on something external and superficial. Can I just say, as a recovering model, <laughs> that, that was my first career confession, um, which is not necessarily something I'm proud of. I, I feel like it's something that I definitely wrestle with because you know, I succumbed to anorexia because of professional pressure. And, you know, not to go into numbers, but I was drastically thinner than I am now. I wound up in the ICU because my intestine collapsed in on itself. I wound up in the ICU because my heart was eating itself. My muscles were eating itself. I feel like this is a book, like I really needed this book at that time. Um, where was I going with this? Um, but I'm curious, you know, for you, Dawn, um, what, what are some messages that you've heard from girls and young women and women throughout your book tour? Um, because I know for me, like, I'm biased. Um, I'm an editor. I'm a publisher of this book. And I absolutely love and adore Dawn as a woman, as a friend. Um, aside from my bias, when this manuscript came, came to me um, from Dr. McKetta, Dr. Elizabeth McKetta, I thought this was a book I needed. I needed, I needed this desperately in my teenage years and in my 20s. And, and it didn't exist. And this message didn't exist that, you know, hey, it's not about you being superficial. It's not about you being controlling or manipulative or an overachiever. It's, it's about shrinking to fit space. It's about shrinking to fit other people's expectations of you, whether it's, you know, you as a model or you just as, as a woman in this world. We shrink ourselves when we're in boardrooms, when we're, when we're in meetings, we change our voices. Um, and this book was something that it would have made a drastic difference in my life. It, it took nearly dying for, for me to put an end to uh, food deprivation and anorexia, which like it's, it's still very hard for me to this day to identify as a recovering anorexic. Um, but I'm curious, you know, what messages that you've heard from women and, and girls beyond mine <laughs> that, that have left an impact on you and let you know, like, 
this book is so poignant and so needed in this world more than ever, especially with the data that's coming out about the increase in suicide, suicide plans that, you know, teenage girls are putting together. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing the story. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for sharing yours. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. There has to be a reason to live. I think that's what it what it really comes down to. Um, all of that data is that there's just not a good enough reason to live. Like we have to do better as a society, giving young women like not do, not even we don't have to give anything. Just stop depriving. Just stop depriving. Right? Um, it's a, I, I quote her in the book, and I both love and adore. Um, Gloria Steinem, right, says power is not given, it's taken, it's very taking of power that is empowerment itself. So I think that um, part of the part of the healing of anorexia and what, I, what I'm hearing from young women and, and especially their mothers or their parents as, as we kind of travel with this message is that it brings hope um, to a, a fairly hopeless conversation because if you are, if you are shrunk to your smallest form, and you are told that any behavior activity toward individuation, however pathological it is, is manipulative and controlling, you are encouraged to further shrink out of the hopeless state of being. I think finding something you care about enough to fight back against that narrative, to take the power, to begin to move into the space, which you can, I'm sure, attest is painful mm -hmm. and challenging and harder than doing the opposite for quite some time. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing from young women is that the message of there must be a reason to push back on this narrative, um, to begin to take up space, you have to care about something enough to say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose a random name. Um, I'm gonna choose my brother because I adore him. And so that's safe. So it's not, it's not accurate. You know, when you're in a boardroom and you, the classic, right? You, you say the thing and then Peter repeats the thing and everyone's like, oh, Peter, what a great idea. You have to do the thing that I do now and say, Peter, thank you so much for saying that in a way that people could hear. Now, what I was trying to say is, right? You have to care enough about something to be able to fight back against that. And I think that the, the tragedy that we're seeing in the data and the tragedy that we're seeing in anorexia is this, you, you've been, there is a disempowering that has happened to these young women. Mm -hmm. Society continues to do this and legislatures around them around the country at least um if not further and and i think that um young women finding a reason to live and and unfortunately they're in a position where they'll have to fight for that um i, I really do think that's the path back and that's what i'm hearing mm -hmm. from girls as well well given this recent uptick since the pandemic the increase in anorexia the increase in mental health crises in girls young women women in general i'm curious you know, the Me Too movement that came about in 2018, and we felt like, oh, that broadened the platform for women's stories and women's voices. Yet, I mean, the statistics are showing that, if, if anything, mental health crises and eating disorders are on the rise for, for women. Um, I'm curious what you think with what's going on politically and the repealing of women's rights. Do you believe that's at play? Or, or what do you think? Are, are some of the contributing factors to this increase? From my own perspective, I think isolation was a huge player, huge. Um, anorexia specifically, and I know most eating disorders, if not all, um, encourage you to isolate and withdraw. So enforced isolation, though it was the right thing to do socially, was very challenging um, to the, uh, the anorexic brain, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so isolation alone is part of it, regardless of anything else going on in the world. But um, yeah, I, I think anorexia is the internalization that you are worthless or that your worth is determined by others. And we are getting that message politically constantly. So I, I think it's, it's a bit of a, it's a push and pull and we just have to push harder um, because that, you know, headway has been made and know that anorexic women are the, not the only people who feel this way. Right? As you, as you <laughs> secure some rights, like those who are like, hey, that was mine. Like, no, that space was never yours. I will claim that space, I will own that space, you will not take that space. Um, I, I think that for me was my own personal process was to, you know, summon the bravery, endure the pain, do all the things to, to, to go from here to here. Hold that 
you get pushed back in everywhere. It's like, mm, hold that. Okay, I'm gonna go here. Okay, hold that. Because I think what's interesting is you're, and maybe I'm wrong. I hope one day I'm wrong. I hope there's a society in which this is wrong, but to take up more space, what I talk about in my book very transparently is you must be pushing back against something that has taken your space. It doesn't want to surrender it. It doesn't think it should have to. Um, so it is a bit of that push and pull. So I do think with the, with the Me Too movement and other, and, um, other feminist and um, across the board, social justice movements, um, there's this like, hey, no, that never made sense in the first place, right? You never deserved that. And there's this pushback that, oh, no, we will have that. And I, I think, unfortunately, this our society is set up such that, you know, Ms. China was right. Yeah. Looks like we're coming up on time. It's 7, 10. We have 20 more minutes. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for Ms. Dawn yet? You've asked wonderful questions. Please don't feel shy. If you've got another, don't hold back. <laughs> well, I'm curious. I know, I know you're a dog mom and a chicken mom mm -hmm. and not necessarily a human mom, but that is still, it still counts. It's still lovely. <laughs> um, but I'm curious if, what advice you would give to parents and, and to siblings even who have an anorexic in their life? What, what, what can they do to help beyond, you know, going to family-based therapy, which sounds like that's the most beneficial, but what can they say? What can they do to help an anorexic on her journey? Thank you for asking that question because it brings it back to a question I didn't completely answer. I'm so sorry, I got off track. Um, it's really challenging. It's really challenging. Uh, so one thing I just surrender completely in my book is like, I was impossible. I was just completely, but there was no right thing to say. Every word that entered my brain went through this filter that turned it into something awful. And there was nothing anyone could do about that. It was, it's very difficult. So first I just want, I want to honor the effort and not pretend like, you know, you're doing it all wrong. You need to do it this way. I am the last person to pretend that there is anything easy about any of this. I was, I felt unlovable. I know I wasn't, but man, I was not easy. So I want to start there, <laughs> recognizing that ground, right? Um, but there's a reason for it. And, and I think the other challenge is that it's counterintuitive. What I think helps is counterintuitive. You feel like what you need to do is like, I'm in, right? And hover and fix and hold. And, and at, in medical emergencies, obviously that needs to happen. And we both had those where, you know, a proper refeeding process is critical or you will, you will suffer the devastation of losing your loved one when they start to eat again because they didn't have the perfect, the perfect bag of, you know, sodium and potassium and all the things mm -hmm. that are gonna fire the heart in the right way. It's terrifying when you're refeeding. So let's be very clear, like medical emergencies are medical emergencies mm -hmm. and that needs to be treated by medical staff and they can be as overbearing as they need to. And that's, that's a real thing. From a family relational perspective, it's the hardest thing in the world, but back off, give her space, get really curious about what she wants. By the way, she has no clue what she wants. It's never mattered. It's never mattered. So when you ask her what she wants and she doesn't know, don't get impatient. She's never ever really considered the question, right? Ask her and refuse to say what you want. Like, don't get in the way. Where would you like to go to dinner? That's probably not the right one. Which, uh, you know, what activity would you like to do? That's, that's how my wife practices with me now. She's like, where'd you like to go to dinner? I'm like, oh, I didn't make, make the decision. I hate this. Um, but something specifically non food related. And then don't wait, don't overstep. Let her start to learn how to take up that space. And that's just one simple example. But she has no idea what she wants. I'll speak for myself. I had no idea what I wanted. It never mattered. I wasn't even clear about what I needed. That was the first step. What do you need? My dear, what do you need? Okay, way, way beyond that, what do you want? As I say in my book, if you go to what you want first, what she's going to say is what she knows you want. Yeah, that's safe. So what do you need, right? And then after she's filled that space, what do you want? I'll promise someone to ask you one more question. No, I'm so glad you are. <laughs> oh, please do. So given given your relationship with food and your um, you know your 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 past profession as a great chef, correct? Right? Um, I always like to ask a question, I'll leave it on the high, but if you could just tell me what would be like your most favorite meal to sit down to now. 
if mm -hmm. you could just tell us. Wow. Well, we have a question. What would be Dawn's favorite meal to sit down to now? Or a perfect meal. Or a perfect meal. I love that question. You know, I've always said, even when I was cooking professionally, that it's never about the food. And Rex is not about the food. It's not about the food. It's about, um, when I was cooking, it was about the, the conversations that happened around the dinner table, right? And the way that it brought people together and the, the community relationships that are necessary to actually create a good meal. And mm -hmm. I, I loved that of it. Um, I, I would like to say I like really simple things, and I do. Asking for a favorite meal is probably going to be something <laughs> complicated and multi-course. Um, I don't know though. I was uh, just having this conversation yesterday, like a French baguette, like slathered with creme fraiche and like chunks of fig jam on top. I mean, that would send me straight to heaven. That's, that's pretty delicious. Uh, but I could, I could keep us here all night listing um, my favorite foods. Probably. There's a lot of good recipes in this book. I'll just say that. <laughs> that was that was one aspect of the book I loved. Um, you know, this isn't a book just about anorexia. It's about romantic love, familial love, and also platonic love. And your friend Emily, who was a huge support in kind of bringing you back and opening you up and filling you up with love and with food. And you know, I'm curious if you can speak to that a little bit, but how, how a friend of an anorexic, you know, can hold space and can kind of open up the world once again to an anorexic. She did it, she did it for you. And she wrote a beautiful, beautiful prologue um, or epilogue rather in this book that everybody should read. Thank you for that question. Now I am here because of Emily Tacey Parker. I would not be here without knowing to the park out. I would never have survived that journey. Um, she did write the most gorgeous epilogue and Dr. Uh, Katarina Maliaskaya wrote a beautiful prologue. And as I say, like you should bookend your book with people who are <laughs> much better writers than you are. <laughs> so where they, what a reader it starts with and where they uh, finish is, uh, is exceptional. Um, Emily brought me joy. She brought me joy. And that really brings us back to you know, the fight, what you need, it's hard. We talked a lot about that. Um, but the, but if we back that all the way up and I had to do all that to get to stable ground where I do not feel like I can be rocked in the way that I have been rocked historically. I, that was all true. But to find the strength to take that first step, I had to care about something. And that's usually not done in under duress, duress or you know, need for power, any, any of that nonsense, it's joy. So Emily was my joy. She was absolutely hilarious and willing to be so, and it seemed really scary. Um, she introduced me to a lot of really great music. Um, we were the best of friends in high school, and she, she just walked me. She walked me out, even though she felt like she didn't know what she was doing. She was doing exactly the right thing by just not confronting me constantly with the obvious. Don't confront them with the obvious, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Give them a reason to not be doing that anymore, right? Give mm -hmm. them, like, don't don't focus on what you already know is terrible. They trust me, they're hearing it all the time up here. The voice is relentless. Um, but Emily just gave me space and love mm -hmm. through joy and laughter and, and let me show up to that as I could. And that was um, that was a whole lot better than what was going on in my head. That was a beautiful journey that, that you took us on with, with your platonic love, with your relationship with Emily. And there is so much more in here. And um, I'm curious, Don, have you experienced a backlash from, from people in your life or that, that you've written about? And you didn't really roast anybody in this. I feel, I feel like it's just raw and truthful and honest. Um, but have you experienced any kind of backlash from those that you wrote about or from clinicians about, about this theory that you're positing around anorexia? I keep thinking it's coming, I guess, <laughs> and I'm sure it will. No, I probably jinxed you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I, and, it, and it will, of course, like not, not everyone agrees with everything, of course. And, and when you're going against the party line, someone's going to say, to your point, it does, it does help to have some pretty amazing folks saying, yeah, yeah this, this makes sense. Um, but so the short answer is no, uh, but I, I do not have enough hubris to assume that the answer will remain no. 
from clinicians, um, so far incredible support. Mm -hmm. Someone else who spoke to the book and spoke to modernizing the perception and treatment of anorexia, which is exactly what we're talking about here. Um, Dr. Dory Swamy was also the former co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Mental Health. That's an alphabet, but he also probably knows what he's talking about. So I think it's helpful yeah. to have some of some of that support, recognizing, you know, I am not prescriptive. I do not have the answer. If he came to me and said, how can we reduce the um, mortality rate of anorexia? I would love to believe that some of these things would help. Can I prove that? Of course not. I just know that what we're doing now isn't um, isn't getting us there. And this is what got me there. That's all that I know for sure. Um, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> if you've experienced any backlash, which you haven't. No, no, not yet. But in terms of the people in my book, that was, you know, everyone in here is still alive. Mm -hmm. So my rule was, if you're in the book, you get to read it before it comes out. Um, so there, there are no surprises. Uh, the only person who didn't get to read it is my father, and it's just because I don't trust him. Um, so we'll see how that goes, but uh, everything is completely honest. Mm -hmm. um, it's true. And, um, there were, there, there was a request for two changes in the book that I received from everyone who read it. Both came from my mother one and now I'm forgetting, but one or the other, when you read the book, you can correct me. She said, I drove a 280 seat. <laughs> yes, mama. Um, and the other was, I was a sharp shooter, not an accident. Yes. Uh, she also said you were very kind to your father, which I appreciate because the cer it certainly wasn't, this story is not meant to grill anyone. This story is meant for me to tell my story. And then as much as my story butted up against other stories, I told only as much as was critical to my story. I was very conscious about that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more questions? I know we're coming up on time shortly. I guess um, one question I have, it just seems that uh, the the whole idea that almost the theory, let's just say, of what causes this with control being kind of the party line I've always heard my whole life, that that's mm -hmm. what it is. How, how could there be um, a, a quick communication out over and above being able to, to read the book that might help to get to those who need the message faster, whether it be people who are treating others with the, the disorder or people who are experiencing it? Is there other vehicles and media opportunities to kind of get this word out to kind of debunk the urban myths and legends that go along with this, with this disease? What a beautiful question. How do we debunk um, the myth? Right? And how do we do it quickly? Because maybe it'll help. Ah. Mitchell, how do we do that? Um, <laughs> it's a great question, though. I, I was I was really pleased at the reception that this received at the like R and D neuroscience level because that's that's where it needs to. That's mm -hmm. what will change it, right? So I was I was very keen to go top down on this. I, I am a I am nonprofit at heart. I am a community builder. My master's is in public policy and administration. Like I I love. I am of the people, um, but if you want to change it, you're talking policy top down, right? From my perspective, so I don't, um, I don't have that answer. But that is where I started the conversation. And as I say, I like to think of myself as you know, a stitch in the quilt. I, I'm, I am, I am one person standing there, throwing my bird song out into the forest. And I know there are others doing the same. Um, and and hopefully that will turn the tide. But I mean, of course, more voices are always welcome in, in whatever way we can just share like, hey, this perception doesn't seem to be working. Let's try, let's try this other one that we know has worked for some. And I guess just a follow up to that, it sounds like there are others that have basically experienced it and have come to the same or similar conclusion. Is there a, you know, a stitching of that, you know, quilt that is, is bringing people together to, to get the word out? There has to be because I, I I am not delusional or arrogant enough to think that like this is some original idea. Right? I have not heard it or read it anywhere else, but it, it must exist all over the place because that is how history works, right? So I'm I'm putting my voice out there as loudly as I know how to and as loudly as I can, and and looking for those others saying the same thing. And then you have you know folks like Dr. Ensel and 
the Nagi and Dorsomi and so many others doing incredible work, you know, on the ground and from a policy perspective. Um, but yeah, the more the more voices, the better. And you can imagine when I, when I get off this tour and, and sit down for one minute and, and put my feet up, Stephanie, um, <laughs> I will definitely be looking for those collaborators. I, I've found a number of them along the way, right? Dr. Amy Cuddy is light years ahead, not from necessarily the perspective of eating disorders, but it it completely applies and it answers so many questions. There's so many researchers, you know, who will be relying on um, to change to change the message. So much work is being done. And so I am I am under no delusion that I am just like the lone voice, <laughs> um, just from a from a patient perspective, as as honest as I know how to say it. <laughs> Excellent. All right. I'm sure you will all join me in thanking Dawn for being so vulnerable and so courageous in writing this book and beyond being your editor and your publisher, being a woman who, who has had to shrink in spaces, being a recovering anorexic, um, being a reader. This is a delightful book. This is a book that is going to make waves in this world. It is a landmark memoir. It has done wonders for me. I'm sure it's done wonders for women who've come out and heard you speak already, for those who've read your book. Um, I am incredibly grateful to, to have played a small part in bringing this book into the world. And, and thank you. And I can't wait to read your next book. <laughs> next book. You've been a massive part, Terry. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone.